So, let's talk about the metaverse, shall we? This October, Facebook released a 77 minute long video presentation to serve as the keynote for its annual Connect conference. Hosted by failed Turing test attempt Mark Zuckerberg, most of the actual product announcements made during the presentation were fairly lackluster. Although if you were the one person waiting on the edge of your seat for the release of Dropbox in VR, then I am sincerely happy for you. What captured the attention of the press, social media and other onlookers was, instead, the overall narrative of the video. See, Zuckerberg announced that Facebook would be restructuring and rebranding itself as Meta. This was, he said, to reflect the company's new focus on building something called the Metaverse. Taking its name from a 1992 science fiction novel, the Metaverse is Zuckerberg's, and others, name for a proposed evolution of the internet, in which virtual and augmented reality technologies allow us to interact in more immersive, embodied ways. In short, it's Ready Player One, but less dystopian, because... Well, I, I, I guess, sort of the... In the short term, a lot of this is just marketing hype. The presentation skips back and forth between discussing bold visions of the future and simply rebranding the digital environments of already existing VR games as metaverses. There's one section on fitness in which we watch a CGI-aided mock-up of Zuckerberg using augmented reality glasses to have a live online fencing match with Olympic champion Lee Kiefer in his garden. All of this as a precursor to announcing that a few fitness games for the Oculus Quest will be getting some new DLC. Now, we should probably acknowledge that if the presentation occasionally came across as the unhinged fever dream of a man who's so rich and powerful that everyone around him is too scared to tell him how dumb he looks, the PR team at Facebook probably didn't mind that much. If everyone was talking about the bottle of barbecue sauce on Zuckerberg's bookshelf, then at least they weren't talking about the hundreds of internal documents leaked a few days earlier, which confirmed Facebook's meticulous knowledge of, yet lack of action upon, the use of its platforms to spread disinformation and incite violence across the world. In reacting to Zuckerberg's metaverse announcement itself, however, it's tempting to cling to the extremes. Many companies, financial media outlets and other bodies, including our good old friends at the World Economic Forum, have embraced both the terminology and concept as being of epoch-making significance. Others, including Iceland's Tourist Board, have simply mocked it as another example of how out of touch our new tech overlords have become. I want to take a slightly more middling approach. See, whether or not it's truly likely that we'll all soon be spending a sizeable portion of our time with our faces stuffed inside sweaty VR headsets, the confidence with which Zuckerberg announced the idea gives us a revealing insight into the direction that big tech companies would like to drag our world in the near future. Being able to engage in debates surrounding the metaverse, however, first requires having a decent understanding of how tech companies such as Facebook, or Meta, Google, Apple, Amazon, and even the Roblox Corporation have already fundamentally reshaped the economic structure around which our society is built, i.e. capitalism. For it's only once we've got a clear idea of where we are now and how we got here that we can have a truly informed discussion of where we might be going next. Breaking down the ways in which digital platforms have reshaped the world in which we live is going to involve a fair bit of talking about gargantuan monopolistic corporations, changing business models, and yes, capitalism's persistent refusal to just die already, all of which can seem a little abstract. As such, I want to start by taking a more human perspective. In order to do so, I need you to cast your mind back to early 2019. COVID-19 is still just a common cold for bats, 
Game of Thrones is still a highly regarded TV show, and on YouTube, the discourse is dominated by one word. Burnout. Over the course of the previous year, several creators had released videos disclosing the devastating impact that being a YouTuber was having on their mental health. The exact causes varied from creator to creator. Canadian vlogger Elle Mills concluded that the speed at which he'd found success had simply been overwhelming. Irish streamer Jacksepticeye alternatively reflected that a gruelling release schedule had sapped his creativity. One recurring theme, however, was a lack of control. Whether in relation to pleasing the platform's recommendations algorithm, avoiding copyright strikes, or demonetization, creators attested to the mental toll that comes with having your career be so dependent on the whims of a gigantic tech company. Now, while I more than recognise many of the pressures described by those creators, I'm not going to try and convince you that YouTubers are the true dispossessed of the internet age with nothing to lose but their video games. Instead, I bring this up because this feeling of a lack of control and a lack of choice has become ever present in our interactions with the digital platforms which dominate our lives. The frustrations of burnt out YouTubers are echoed, for example, by those who make a living on other platforms. Browse the official Etsy forums, and one finds sellers complaining about perceived changes to that site's search ranking algorithm in tones that are indistinguishable from YouTubers complaining about their subscribers not being recommended their latest releases. Or, if you want a more immediate example of the power imbalance between digital platforms and those who work on them, think of the OnlyFans creators who, in August 2021, were told that the platform would be banning sexually explicit content. Before the company reversed the decision five days later, hundreds of thousands of creators were faced with having their livelihoods taken from them in the blink of an eye. Even if you're a checkout assistant, or a teacher, or a grave digger whose job has yet to be platformized, you no doubt also find yourself being constantly coerced by big tech. Few people actively want to hand over the extraordinary amount of data these platforms extract from us on a daily basis. Google, Amazon, Facebook and their would-be competitors, however, have made themselves so essential to our everyday lives that refusing to use their products entirely would be to become a social and professional outcome. When, in October 2021, Facebook and its associated services went down for almost six hours, it was easy to make jokes about it mostly affecting the anti-vax misinformation industry. Yet, if we think about it, if such an outage were to last, whole sectors of our economy, which have come to rely on Facebook for marketing or sales, would hang in the balance. Of course, this is not the first time that a relatively small set of companies has come to wield an astonishing amount of power. The USA's so-called antitrust laws, which aim to prevent companies from becoming monopolies, and with which Facebook and Google are constantly being threatened, were originally introduced to stop railroad companies from gaining a stranglehold on trade in the late 19th century. What is novel is the particular way in which today's tech companies have managed to wrap their fingers around society's throat. See, as in the case of the 2020 documentary The Social Dilemma, the mainstream conversation surrounding big tech's domination of the contemporary world tends to view digital platforms solely as a form of technology, as a set of algorithms, recommendation systems, and design assets. Yet, in his 2017 book Platform Capitalism, the digital economist Nick Cernick argues that it's just as important to view these platforms as examples of a new kind of business model, which is reshaping capitalism as we know it. It's this business model, as much as the technologies which sustain it, which has allowed companies such as Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Uber to become so dominant in our society, and left the rest of us feeling so powerless. Examining business models and the changing structure of capitalism may not be as instantly thrilling or sexy as talking in hushed tones about how social media is hacking your brain, 
but it does provide far more insight into some of the motivations behind Zuckerberg's metaverse fantasy. So, for the remainder of this video, I'm going to ask you to put the rose-tinted VR headset to one side in order that we can view the digital platforms which surround us not through the eyes of software engineers, but through those of economists. The best way to explain what Cernic calls platform capitalism is through telling the story of its birth. And in order to do that, we're going to need to time travel back just a tiny bit further. This is the last time though, I promise. Our story begins on the 15th of September 2008, when Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest investment bank in the United States, filed for bankruptcy. The world watched with a mixture of horror and glee, as once cocky analysts and advisors were escorted from their offices. The global financial crisis of which this was the climax, however, also affected good people. Over the course of 2008, 3.6 million jobs disappeared in the US alone, whilst 2.3 million American households were served with foreclosure notices. As anger rose, there was a brief moment when it looks like this might mark the end for our good old friend capitalism. Yet, one month before the collapse of Lehman Brothers, a pair of flatmates in San Francisco had launched a little app called Airbnb which, in popularising a new way of doing business, would provide the basis for a new era of profit making. That's not to say that Airbnb was invented out of nothing. It took substantial influence from several pre-existing services. Most notably, the platform dressed itself up in the clothes of a social media site. Like Facebook or Twitter, Airbnb required users to create a profile, detailing where they live, their interests, and, of course, to upload a photo of themselves. All of which had... Uh, consequences. Yet Airbnb was also similar to its social media predecessors in a less obvious way. See, if you think about why you choose to use Facebook or Twitter, it probably has little to do with the website itself. Unless you're just really into the colour blue, the thing actually drawing you to Facebook is your need to catch up on what minion memes currently have your Aunt Sharon rolling on the floor laughing and your interest in maybe joining a militia. In short, while other websites looking to attract visitors have to do boring things like pay people to create good content, Facebook need not bother. It's found a way to profit from simply owning the space in which content gets shared. As Mackenzie Walk puts it, we have to entertain each other while they collect the rent. Airbnb's business model is startlingly similar. If any of us idiots dreamt of owning the largest hotel room provider in the world, we'd probably start by purchasing one hotel and then, if that went well, purchasing another, and then another, and another. The founders of Airbnb, however, soon discovered that the smart money wasn't in owning buildings which need to be maintained and insured and cleaned, etc., but instead in simply positioning themselves as an intermediary between those with rooms to let and those in need of somewhere to stay. As we now know, this way of doing business caught on. In 2009, Uber launched. Similarly to Airbnb, Uber's founders worked out that the best way to make money in the taxicab industry wasn't to buy a bunch of cars and then hire an army of drivers. Instead, Uber could simply provide a digital space in which people in need of a lift could find independent contractors to drive them to where they needed to go, and the company could pocket 25% of the fare for the privilege. Large portions of the revenues of YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, Alibaba, Netflix, Epic Games, Google, Patreon, Fiverr, Apple, and many more come from these companies not producing anything of their own, but acting as little more than intermediaries of one sort or another. Now, I can quite imagine that there are a fair few people watching this video who are currently cracking their knuckles and preparing to write something in the comments along the lines of SHOPS, YOU IDIOT! YOU ABSOLUTE BUFFOON! YOU'RE JUST DESCRIBING SHOPS! THIS ISN'T ANYTHING NEW! And while I'd prefer them to be a little less rude in making their thoughts known, they do kind of have a point. The key differences lie in the ways that these companies avoid risk, the scale at which they operate, 
and the resulting power that this enables them to wield. But before we go any further, I'd like to take a moment to give a shout out to today's video sponsor, Surfshark VPN. Take control of your online identity and privacy by heading to surfshark.deals forward slash Tom Nicholas, where you can get 83% off a two year plan and an extra four months for free, allowing you to safely and securely browse the web for just $2.21 a month. One vital aspect of platform capitalism that we're not going to have much of a chance to talk about today is its reliance on the mass collection of user data. I certainly find that surfing the web these days can often feel as though every website you visit knows exactly who you are and where you are. Surfshark allows you to get back in control of what websites and your internet service provider can see about who you are and what you get up to through essentially creating a private internet connection to keep you safe and secure whenever and however you get online. Surfshark has tons of great features. As I've mentioned before, one aspect I love is the ability to convince websites that you're in other countries. This is particularly great when used with streaming services, as it allowed you to unlock tons of extra content by letting you use different countries' versions of Netflix and the like. So if you want to take advantage of that offer of 83% off a two year plan and an extra four months for free, then you can support the channel by letting them know that I sent you through heading to surfshark.deals forward slash Tom Nicholas. Right, now on with the show. <laughs> Cheers, drive. <sighs> so we've already established that a key aspect of the platform as a business model is that these companies operate primarily as intermediaries. As we'll discuss shortly, some platform companies do also produce their own products and services. Nevertheless, even Netflix, which has invested heavily in the production of exclusive original content in the last few years, still licenses the majority of its catalogue from third parties. Amazon, moreover, has been heading in the other direction. Since 2013, third party sales through Amazon Marketplace have steadily taken a larger and larger share of total transactions carried out through the site, to the point where, in 2021, 56% of purchases made on Amazon weren't actually from Amazon at all. But how do these platforms differ from the middlemen that have plagued humanity since the dawn of time? How does Apple's App Store differ from the city council charging small businesses to set up a stall in the local market? How is Spotify not just an online blockbuster for music and sketchy health advice? Well, some would argue that it's not quite as necessary. In 1995, Bill Gates predicted that the internet would give birth to an age of friction-free capitalism. He wrote that the information highway will extend the electronic marketplace and make it the ultimate go-between, the universal middleman. Often, the only humans involved in a transaction will be the actual buyer and seller. Many of the logistical complexities which physical shops and their suppliers exist to solve have been evaporated by the internet, particularly when it comes to digital products and services. None of this is to say that everyone at Twitter is just sitting around watching Jack Dorsey's beard grow whilst the cash flows in. While many people are clearly very happy to look past Facebook's ugly and frankly confusing UI, platform companies have to ensure that their services retain some kind of basic usability. At least until quite recently, however, some platform companies had mastered the art of doing as little as possible whilst making as much money as possible. Cernic refers to such companies as lean platforms, where everything that can be outsourced is outsourced until all that remains is a bare extractive minimum, control over the platform that enables a monopoly rent to be gained. Uber, for example, not only minimizes risk through not owning any vehicles, but also through using Google Maps for navigation and hiring server time from Amazon. Both of these costs are based on usage. So if, for example, a pandemic or whatever 2022 has got in store for us hits, the company's income might fall, but so do its costs. Airbnb, Netflix and Spotify all hire servers in this way to reduce risk, whilst, as Phil Jones reports in his book Work Without the Worker, platforms which host user-generated content utilise services such as Mechanical Turk and Rater Hub to outsource content moderation to independent contractors in the global south. 
In 2015, IGN published an article defending Valve, the company that owns Steam, for taking a 30% cut of all sales made through the platform. The article pointed out that this is not only a pretty standard figure equal to that of the PlayStation Store and Apple's App Store, but is also the same as the cut taken by physical shops like GameStop and Best Buy. What this reasoning ignores, however, is that digital platforms, whatever the goods or services they act as an intermediary for, generally have far lower costs and take on a far lesser degree of risk than their pre-internet equivalents. In fact, wherever the internet has reduced friction, as Gates predicted, a platform company seems to have inserted itself into the gap, pocketing any savings for itself. Now, as I've already hinted, more extreme examples of this lean platform business model have begun to come under strain in recent years, as people have begun to ask why these companies should gain such a high reward for such little work. In 2017, for example, someone at Disney clearly had the realisation that having managed to gobble up a sizeable portion of English language film and TV culture, it was pretty dumb of them to be letting Netflix take a cut of streaming revenues. The threat of other companies following in Disney's footsteps and launching their own streaming services has forced Netflix to spend huge sums of money on buying exclusive distribution rights to new programming, released under its Netflix Originals banner. At the other end of the scale, there's been growing pushback against Uber's reliance on precarious labour. In February 2021, the UK's Supreme Court ruled that some drivers could no longer be treated as independent contractors, but had to instead be treated as workers, with an entitlement to the minimum wage. There is a long way to go, but it seems that some of the loopholes these companies were able to exploit might be closing. This, however, is far from the end of platform capitalism. To understand why, and to join the dots between services like Uber and Zuckerberg's Metaverse, we have to look at another couple of key aspects of digital platforms. Their scale, and the power this allows them to wield. We've talked a lot so far about the various things that platform companies are able to get away with not doing. In extreme cases, such as that as Uber, we find companies that produce no goods, provide no services, and take on little risk, instead simply profiting off being an intermediary in the transactions of others. Nevertheless, not all platform companies are this lazy. Apple is an interesting example of a company that does so much that we might not initially think of it as a platform company at all. It makes a whole range of products and erects glowing glass cathedrals to itself on top of sites of historical interest. Moreover, all of this clearly involves risk. What if they accidentally build a shop in a town that's already overflowing with HomePod minis? At first glance, the humble app store seems like little more than a cheeky side hustle. Nevertheless, Apple's cut on sales through the App Store brings in almost twice as much money as the company makes through selling computers. When we stop to think of it, this actually makes a lot of sense. On the iPhone and the iPad, the App Store is the only method through which one can purchase or download an app. This gives the company a complete monopoly on software distribution to iOS users, and allows them to subject both users and developers to pretty much any terms it wants. In fact, this kind of monopolistic control is so profitable that Microsoft, another company that most people probably wouldn't initially think of as a platform company, intentionally loses money on every single Xbox that it sells. Knowing that the additional money it will make by collecting its cut of sales through the Microsoft Store will more than make up for the discount on the hardware. Storefronts such as the App Store, the Microsoft Store, or the Nintendo eShop may initially seem like eccentric outsiders. Yet, beyond these coercive ecosystems, we actually find platforms to be more prone to the development of monopolies, not less. We've already discussed the fact that, while each social media platform has its own surface-level quirks, which supposedly make them unique, the primary factor which influences which of these platforms that one uses primarily depends on where your friends and family are. It simply doesn't matter if Snapchat's filters help me to unlock the beauty buried deep inside my soul if I've got no friends on the platform to share that beauty with. 
In the early days of social media, this sometimes meant having one group of friends that used Bebo, for example, and another, usually much cooler, group of friends that used MySpace. In fact, the latter group were probably too cool to actually be your friends, but you were 60% sure they knew you existed. As social media became more ubiquitous, however, this process of people being drawn to the sites where their friends and family were repeated and repeated until one platform has come to dwarf all others. We often talk about the different social media platforms as though they're locked in some kind of equitable battle. But Facebook has more than five times the number of active users as Twitter and twice as many as Instagram, which Facebook owns anyway. The media scholar Amanda Lotz has argued that Facebook's near eradication of its competition is the result of social media being what economists call a natural monopoly. This term has traditionally been used in relation to utilities, such as water and electricity, where having multiple firms competing for business is so ineffective that one company quickly gets a stranglehold on the sector, and high startup costs make the emergence of a competitor all but impossible. There's a reason you don't hear about trendy new water companies being founded. The cost of building an alternative pipe network would be astronomical. In order to stop an unscrupulous capitalist taking advantage of this scenario, many countries and cities have publicly owned utility companies. That is, unless you live on an island self-loathing enough to have elected Margaret Thatcher. The network of social connections between friends and family members, which are sort of the equivalent to the pipes in this scenario, similarly made the emergence of a social media monopoly inevitable. Google spent $585 million building Google+, Plus, but still couldn't peel people away from Facebook. And of course they couldn't, Facebook was where everyone's friends were. The same process has occurred with Amazon. As the site has attracted more customers, more retailers have chosen to sell on the platform which has in turn attracted more customers, which has attracted more retailers, and on and on until, in 2021, sales through the site are predicted to account for more than 50% of all online retail activity in the United States. While the larger platform companies do do a lot more than Uber or Airbnb then, these activities serve to either lock people into their platforms or to take advantage of those caught within them already. Over the past few years, for example, Amazon has brought much of its logistics in-house, throwing up cavernous warehouses and amassing a fleet of vans, trucks and planes. While also providing the company with further opportunities to treat its workers like shite, these services allow the company to squeeze even more money out of sellers. While sellers can choose to use alternative couriers, only those who pay to use Amazon's warehouses and delivery services are able to offer prime delivery. This, in turn, reportedly leads to Amazon's algorithms looking more fondly upon a seller's products, and thus to more sales. As companies such as Facebook and Amazon edge closer and closer to wielding monopoly power in their relevant sectors, it's not solely the case that they get bigger. Instead, they morph from being companies into… something more. Facebook evolved from being a website on which people can message their friends into the default medium for remote human interaction. Amazon stops being an online marketplace and becomes, instead, the online retail market. This gives these companies extraordinary amounts of power, not only within their own ecosystems, but in society more broadly. You'd be forgiven for thinking that this level of domination might be enough for our aristocracy of nerds, that Jeff Bezos could chill out a bit, use his stacks of cash to try and actually go to space rather than just tickle the edge like a coward. Nevertheless, contemporary capitalism is all about growth. And how do you grow if, like Facebook or Amazon, you've already monopolised an entire industry? Well, you build a metaverse, of course. Given it was their CEO that set us off on this journey of discovery through the inner workings of platform capitalism, it seems apt, in considering what all of this might reveal about the metaverse, to focus primarily on the company formerly known as Facebook. And it's important to begin by noting that some of the company's motivations for urging us to take this step into the metaverse remain entirely within the logic of platform capitalism. See, Whilst in most regards Facebook has been a winner of platform capitalism, there is one key way in which it has had to suffer its drawbacks. 
As Shirin Gaffery points out in an article for Vox, Facebook is currently forced to distribute its mobile apps through app stores owned by Apple and Google. This means that it has to abide by those companies' terms and, in the case of iOS, hand over a full 30% of any revenue generated through in-app purchases. In some regards, this puts Zuckerberg's great behemoth of a company in the same position as those YouTubers, OnlyFans creators, and Etsy sellers we discussed towards the beginning of this video. In his presentation, Zuckerberg was pretty disparaging of mobile phones and tablets as means of communication. He proposed that screens just can't convey the full range of human expression and connection. They can't deliver that deep feeling of presence. This may be the case, but it's worth bearing in mind that Zuckerberg has good economic reasons for wanting to push us beyond an era in which it is, in some respects, at the whims of Apple and Google. But let's not be under the illusion that Zuckerberg wants us to move beyond platform capitalism entirely. Instead, he simply wants to be the one in control. As a result of its 2014 acquisition of Oculus, Zuckerberg's company accounted for 75% of VR headsets sold in the first quarter of 2021. A future in which using the internet involves flailing our arms around in our living rooms with screens strapped to our faces then would see Apple and Google dethroned by Meta who would then have control over the most powerful operating system and its app store. Meta is even borrowing Microsoft's trick of subsidizing the upfront cost of headsets. Zuckerberg stated in his Facebook Connect presentation that, we plan to continue to either subsidize our devices or sell them at cost to make them available to more people. This may sound very philanthropic, but it's ultimately a savvy business move to entice people into the company's ecosystem and establish an upper hand in the next evolution of personal computing. There is another, slightly more novel, side to Zuckerberg's metaverse vision, however. See, having already established monopoly control over social media, Meta finds itself in a similar position to that of the Coca-Cola company 50 or so years earlier. During the latter half of the 20th century, Coke established such a strong sales lead over Pepsi that it began to find the metric of market share a little underambitious. So strong was the company's performance that its CEO, Robert Goizetta, was forced to invent the concept of throat share. No longer would the company simply measure its success by whether more people were buying Coke than Pepsi or Dr Pepper or Panda Pops. Success would instead be measured in the volume of Coke drunk as a proportion of the world's total fluid intake. Of course, Facebook has been measuring the time users spend on its platforms, rather than just the total number of users, for some time. There's a clear ceiling to what they can achieve here though. Eventually, the company is going to find the limit of how much time people can spend mindlessly surfing the web. The goal then is no longer just to attract more users, nor to make those users spend more time on Facebook and Instagram rather than Twitter or TikTok. Instead, it is to expand the company's offerings so that a greater proportion of human life is channeled through its services. This is most overt and maybe most mundane in the focus that Zuckerberg gave to workplace implementations of VR. Meta already offers a tool called Workplace, which is apparently used by companies including Nestle and ASOS. Nevertheless, it lacks the ubiquity of Slack or Microsoft Teams. Here, as with the focus on fitness, Zuckerberg clearly sees the opportunity to use a shift towards VR to make inroads into these markets. In both these areas, however, the competition is not just other apps. Despite the impact of the pandemic over the last couple of years, much of our work lives are not yet platformized. And while I would likely break down in tears if I completed a run and couldn't upload it to Strava, most exercise happens outside of the domain of platform companies too. Meta is therefore on a mission to expand the range of activities that take place under its watch. Such expansions dominated Zuckerberg's presentation, with the suggestion that meeting up with friends and going to concerts could all be further dragged into Meta's ecosystem, providing the company with the opportunity to monetize and control further aspects of our lives. 
Zuckerberg clearly preempted these concerns. As he put it, this isn't about spending more time on screens, it's about making the time we already spent better. Nevertheless, anyone who spent any time using VR will know that regardless of how fun and immersive it can be, doing so requires energy and intentionality. If Zuckerberg gets his way, then it seems highly unlikely that anyone is going to replace the time they presently spend in bed, scrolling mindlessly through their social feeds, with leaping around in some immersive VR environment. Time spent socialising and attending events in the metaverse will most probably replace the time we previously spent talking on the phone or heading out into the real world. None of this is to fearmonger about VR, because we should believe Zuckerberg when he says that VR is not what is being pitched in. Instead, what we see in Facebook's vision of the metaverse is the consequence of a company, among several, which has found a limit to the capital it can extract from society's present relationship with technology. It thus finds it necessary to push us to rethink that relationship. While many of the particular technologies that serve as the window dressing for that pitch, maybe NFTs aside, have exciting implementations, they are just that, window dressing. What lies behind them in this instance is the desire of companies who already have considerable power in our society to insert themselves as intermediaries into spheres of our lives previously thought to be beyond them. And Given the impact that platform capitalism has already had on our world, this is probably something that should give us pause for thought. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it's been worthy of your time. If you have any friends either online or off who you think also might get something out of it, then I would love it if you consider sharing it with them in some way. Uh, thank you as ever to Richard, to Kaya Lau, David Brothers, Alan Gann, Luke Meyer, Gary, Dylan Gordon, Dickon Spain, Greg Miller, Bill Mitchell, ZC Reese, Brent Cottle, Shab Kumar, Anil, Alexander Blank, Neil Zabildgaard, Sophia R, President Dwayne Elizondo, Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho, Sergio Suarez, 2Bro2B, Alexandra McGuinness Wartendike, Courtney and Richard, Nicholas Jacquemart, Manfred Sek. Thomas Downing, Strange Weekend, and Ricardo Fernandez de Cordoba for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. If you'd like to join them in supporting what I do here whilst getting early access to videos, copies of scripts to them, and more, then you can find out how to do so at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thank you once again for watching and have a fantastic week.